I've always shared with you. That you have. If I had two cigarettes, I'd give you one. That's right. And if I had two pairs of shoes, I'd give you a pair. Don't I know that? And if I have two girls... Uh, well? Why don't you light that cigarette, put on those shoes, and take a walk for yourself? The comedy double act has become a lost form of performance. While the occasional comedy pairing is still popular today, they in no way reached the same level of longevity and sheer volume of work as duos did in the early 20th century. Case in point, Abbott and Costello. A comedy double act who dominated each platform they performed in. They not only headlined 36 elaborate and varied movies, they also hosted an acclaimed radio program and created what is considered to be one of the most influential TV sitcoms of all time. These feats are all the more impressive considering they accomplished them in just over two decades. <laughs> but their legacy wouldn't end there, with an animated series and countless homages to follow. Give me the bird! Give me the bird! If the Hayes office would only let me, I'd give him the point, all right? Not to mention generations of comedians born from their influence. No, please, excuse yourself. Individually, they couldn't have been more contrasting, particularly in their cadence, delivery, and physical appearances. All behaviors. I was playing choo-choo train. Never mind that. I, you never let me have no fun. Be quiet. But as a pair, they sync together perfectly. Put a dollar in the pot. Oh, silly game. Look, the pot on the table. Pot on the table? Certainly. All right, now will you take that off? What are you what doing? You, you told me so! Not that! Their comedy was almost rhythmic in its delivery. A carefully crafted rapport that included lightning fast wordplay. Yeah, $15 went south. What do you mean? You gave me a lot of fast talk. You see, I got two tens for a five and I give it to you. Oh, you did. Wise guy. Okay, here's your five. Give me back my two tens. That's better. Now get out of here. Okay. All right, now you want to more. Ten more to you. That's the idea. How about you, friend? And physical comedy. Where are you guys going? We're walking out. Today, while they are most known for their iconic who's on first routine, a routine that Bud and Lou didn't originate, but one they reinvented and performed best. That's whose name? Yes. Have you got a contract with the first baseman? Well, naturally. Who signed the contract? Well, now, you wouldn't expect anybody else to sign it. But who? Yes. Or their collaborations with Universal's monsters, seasoned fans of their work know that there is so much more to their lives and partnership. So let's take a look back at how William Abbott and Louis Costello became Abbott and Costello creating a chemistry that changed comedy performance forever. As with other popular comedy teams of that era, Abbott and Costello's pairing seemed to come about by pure chance. In 1935, they were both booked to appear on the same bill with their own respective partners at a burlesque theater in New York. When Lou's straight man partner became ill, Bud Abbott filled in for him. While they would have a long road ahead of them, the two knew from their first moments on stage that they clicked together like they hadn't with their other partners. Our timing, our timing was perfect for each other, but it took, oh, at least three years of struggle to get our first act uh, organized and uh, material together. While Lou Costello deserves credit as being the perfect comic foil, expertly projecting his frustrations onto the audience. Hold that. Unpack that grip. Unpack the grip! Run away. We got nothing to fear. That's right. But on second thought, if they came in that door right now, you know what would happen? they take us to jail. Pack that grip. Pack that grip. Hurry up before they get in here. Pack that grip. That's fine. Bud Abbott deserves mentioning as probably the best straight man that there ever was. Look, you're 40 years old and you're in love with this little girl that's 10 years old. Now, you're four times as old as that girl. You couldn't marry her, could you? Not unless I come from the mountains. There you go, you see, you would. Why don't you ask me? Shut Wait a minute. Wait till I finish this. Most of the laughs in their comedy routines come from Bud setting up the joke almost effortlessly. Taste that dish. It's delicious. How do you like it? Good. What are you doing? Their natural ability to play off one another made them huge stars on the burlesque circuit throughout the mid-1930s. In 1938, they made their first radio performance. Oh, I'm trying to 
Boris, what else? What's the guy's name on first base? No, what is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? One base at a well, time. Well, don't change the players. Though. I'm not changing nobody. Take it easy, buddy. I'm only asking you, who's the guy on first base? That's right. Okay. All right. <laughs> As radio audiences couldn't visualize them, it was hard to tell them apart, which was essential for their rapid-fire comedy delivery. To combat this, Lou pitched his voice up higher than Bud's, sounding more childish. It was a fixture that would remain in their act from then on. And I heard one of the boys say that. But you didn't play in the game. They wouldn't let me. I was too young. Oh, well, that's different. I didn't Starting know. Tuesday, I'm going out with girls. I don't blame you. As they continued to dominate the airwaves, eventually starting their own program in 1940, Universal Pictures decided to take a gamble and hired them to appear in supporting roles in a comedy film called One Night in the Tropics. While Bud and Lou don't get too much screen time here, they easily steal the show, with all the reviewers at the time suggesting as much. I like Worcestershire here, George. You what? Worcestershire here, George. Worcestershire, share, share, shush. You can't even say it. Universal's gamble had paid off, and they quickly signed the duo to headline two features, commencing with Buck Privates in 1941. The World War II comedy saw Bud and Lou join the ranks of the U.S. military. Suppose you had $5 in this pants pocket and $10 in this pants pocket. What would you have? The captain's pants on. There you are, you oh, What are you asking me those kind of questions for? Well, all silly. What are you asking me a nice easy one? As screenwriters didn't yet understand how to properly utilize them, the duo just worked a lot of their stage routines naturally into the story, accompanied by a romantic subplot and musical numbers by the Andrews sisters. Get your chins up. Get your chest out. Throw out your chest! Get your chest out! Throw it out! I'm not throwing it yet! Quiet! After filming was completed, Universal rushed them into another production, a haunted house comedy to be called Oh Charlie. Oh Charlie? What happened? While filming for this comedy was underway, Buck Privates was released and exploded at the box office, grossing over four million dollars. Cementing Abbott and Costello as movie stars. Arms! Hup, uh, come on, pick it up! I thought I had it. Pick it up! All right! Come on, come on, snap into it! With a surprise smash hit on their hands, Universal decided not to change the formula for their next movie, and O Charlie was put on hold. A Navy based comedy was then quickly developed and rushed into production. It would also include a romantic subplot and musical numbers by the Andrews sisters. I know these numbers were huge crowd pleasures at the time. But when watching today, I always yearn for the plot to get back to Bud and Lou. <laughs> their comedy makes up for the slow pacing, though, with them perfectly adapting their stage routines into the story. There you are. There's one, two. By the way, how many years have you been in the Navy? Six years. Six? What's that got to do with counting out my chains? Six? Yeah. Seven, eight, nine, ten. It's much better. It's also great to see Shemp Howard appear with them in several of these movies. Well, well put it down. I don't see him again with the, the towels or something. Universal actually attempted to mimic the success of Abbott and Costello by teaming Shemp and Wolfman actor Lon Chaney Jr. They only made one film together, though. Seven times thirteen is what? Twenty-eight. Prove it. Seven times three. Twenty-one. Seven times one. Seven. Seven and one. Eight. Two. Two. Oh no! O Charlie was retooled to become Hold That Ghost, shoehorning in nightclub segments so the Andrews sisters could make yet another appearance. <laughs> the movie's success showed the studio that Abbott and Costello didn't need a military backdrop to make a hit. Taste it, Ferdy. Might be poison. Go on, taste it. Might be poison. What are you worrying about? In 1942 alone, they pumped out four films ending with one of their most popular, the murder mystery Who Done It. Murder. 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 Get out. Which was their first film not to include any musical numbers or elongated subplots. The result is a movie with tight pacing that puts Abbott and Costello front and center showing they were capable of carrying a movie on their talents alone. Come here, you. What's your name? I'm That's a lie! Make a note of that. It's in the book. I'm getting a lot of silly things from this guy. He ain't answering me. Well, grill him. Huh? Grill him. I'm not hungry. It also helps that there is an engaging mystery at the film's core, with Bud and Lou worked seamlessly into that. Vote. 
volts or what? Yes. I'm asking you what's volts. That's right. Don't try to twist me now. What are you talking about, a dialect? What's, what's, what's? What's, 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 what? Volts. Universal's vigorous production slate left very little breathing room in between films. Despite this, each of their movies managed to feel different, with different settings and backdrops. They would get stranded on a tropical island paradise in Pardon My Sarong. That's the dollar I owe you. The dollar you owe me? You pick out a fine time to pay me! Where am I gonna spend a dollar up there? He gives me the dollar now that he all owes me right, six all right, dollars. All right. Become heroes of the West in The Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap. When you say that, smile! and escape imprisonment in the Middle East in Lost in a Harem. <laughs> Abbott and Costello didn't reinvent their dynamic for each of these movies. Rather, they carefully adapted their already proven routines to the constantly changing worlds of these movies. I want to tell her. Well, go ahead and tell her. I don't care. No, no, no. Tell her in the bank. Tell her in the bank. Tell her outside. Tell her any place you want. I will listen. They also remade routines popular by other comics, adding their own spin on the joke. What are you doing over there? Soda. And what will you have, Stan? Soda. Just a moment, please. Pardon me. Give me a turkey sandwich and a cup of coffee, please. What do you have? I don't care for them. Oh, go ahead, have something. Give me a turkey sandwich. And... I just get through telling you. I refuse once tonight, that's enough. It's also impressive to watch Lou bounce off the walls doing his own stunts in several impressive sequences throughout their career, while Bud Abbott stands slightly off, just reacting naturally. <gasps> what are you doing now? I don't know how to get you out. I'm not trying you to stop out. playing merry around and stand still. Continuing to pump out several features a year was leading to tensions behind the scenes, though. <laughs> this, combined with Universal wanting to mix things up, would result in two comedies where they wouldn't appear as a duo. One of those, 1946's The Time of Their Lives, is one of their most acclaimed comedies. Here, Bud and Lou play individual characters who don't interact much one-on-one -on -one during the film. The result is a terrific yet different comedy that showcases Abbott and Costello as individual performers. Here you can really see what a great character actor Bud Abbott could have been. As a psychiatrist, I've got to agree with him. And if we all intend to keep our sanity, we've got to get to the bottom of this. As the 1940s were coming to an end, Abbott and Costello signed a new deal that would permit them to make one movie independently of Universal per year. While they had been loaned to MGM in the past... Good time. Are you nervous? I don't know. It was through this arrangement that the duo made some of their most elaborate works, including their only two color movies, Abbott and Costello Meet Captain Kidd. You look different. You do too. <laughs> and later, Jack and the Beanstalk. It was in the late 1940s, though, that Bud and Lou also began their collaborations with the Universal Monsters. I can't go. I got a date. In fact, I got two dates. But you and I have a date with destiny. Let chick go with destiny. I've covered these movies in a separate video because there's so much worth talking about there. But to summarize what I said, all of these team-ups work so well because all the horror elements are played straight and serious, like an actual universal horror movie. The fact that Abbott and Costello are there is just incidental. The result is a perfect blend of styles, becoming some of the most inventive and entertaining horror comedies of all time. Now I'll show you who is the boss. I... No. I'll show you who's boss. Who said that? The voice is familiar but I can't quite place the face. This resulted in most of their movies from then on, including Abbott and Costello in the titles. It was mostly a marketing ploy, with titles such as Abbott and Costello in the Foreign Legion, and one of my personal favorites, Abbott and Costello Go to Mars, in which they don't actually go to Mars, but rather New Orleans. Hey, you 
and later Venus. It's so bizarre and out there that I can't help but appreciate it for what it is. A Bud and Lou take on a sci-fi B-movie. I don't want to go to the moon. If I want any green cheese, I go to the delicatessen. With a new decade dawning, Abbott and Costello continued making films for Universal, though they were failing to draw the same box office numbers as their earlier work. A dog just come out of this one. Uh, hey, a dog was swimming in there. You're crazy. But Bud and Lou still had a trick up their sleeves in the form of the Abbott and Costello show. The surreal TV sitcom was produced for syndication beginning in 1952. Here they were able to establish relationships with other characters, such as the landlord played by Sid Fields. I'd like to see you do that again. Oh, you uh, would, would you? Huh? <laughs> or the pesky Stinky played by Joe Besser. Hey, you're picking on a little boy like I'm that. A, ooh! The show emphasized funny situations over life lessons, something that Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld later used for inspiration when creating Seinfeld. The key over here. Open them up. Give me the key. Yes, give me the key. Let me. Give me the. Give me the key. Where's the key? Go. Go. See where the key went. It ran for two seasons of 26 episodes, and was incredibly popular in its own right. Do that once more! Oh, now listen, once I mean... more, huh? You think I can? In 1954, they finished out their Universal contract, with Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. Well, the shovel is my pick. Oh no, this is a pick, this is a shovel. That's what I picked, is the shovel. How can, how can a shovel be the pick? Look, if I'd have wanted a pick, I'd have picked the pick. They decided not to renew their contract when they couldn't come to terms with the studio. Shut up! Don't stop! I quit! Alright, wait a minute. What are you doing? They made an independent comedy feature next called Dance With Me Henry in 1956. The box office disappointment of this movie put further strains on their partnership though, and they formally dissolved the act in 1957. While they were both open to the possibility of reteaming in the future, Dance With Me Henry would become their final film as a pair. Lou Costello made one solo film called The 30-Foot Bride of Candy Rock the following year. Sadly though, he died of a heart attack shortly after filming had completed, ending one of the most popular comedy acts in film history. You thought I was gonna fall in, and didn't you? Bud Abbott attempted a comeback with a comedian named Candy Candido in the 1960s. Despite a warm reception from audiences, Bud soon dissolved the act, remarking no one could live up to Lou. He eventually retired shortly after, only coming out of retirement once to voice himself in Hanna-Barbera's The Abbott and Costello cartoon show. Dead Zeus! What's that? I don't know, but that's a good name for him, Dad Zooka! It became Bud Abbott's last performance prior to his death in 1974. When examining their career and sheer volume of work, it's hard to imagine anyone else coming close to this level in the future. Abbott and Costello's work is just a wonderful window into a time when two performers couldn't exist without one another. Show me a lifesaver! What? Show me a lifesaver! Well, my lifesaver. Hmm. Okay. Which is really just a testament to how truly special they were as a team. When we were overseas, you didn't fire off a gun. I didn't have to. I did all my fighting with a knife. With a knife? With a knife. I had 6,382 to my credit. Enemies? No, potatoes. Oh, stop. Like Laurel and Hardy before them, these two were so great together that the work they could have accomplished on their own would have been nowhere near as special as what they were able to do together. Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go. Back oh, no, 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 no. Every time you hear those two guys, who's on first? What's on second? I don't know. That little fat guy, he killed... No good. 